Since the dawn of mankind, when the majority of our population lived in small, isolated tribes, there have always been individuals pushing to explore and discover new places to live and colonize. While animals have evolved for thousands of years to adapt to extreme biomes, human beings from a biological standpoint are relatively fragile and weak. And so instead of relying on thick skin, blubber, or fur, humans have always had to use innovation to build protection and even machines to venture to new and exciting places. And as we become more advanced as a society and the Earth becomes an increasingly smaller and tamer place, the next places that we will try to explore will be even more extreme and dangerous. And so to reach the new frontiers of the 21st century and beyond, we'll need to build some even more amazing machines and gadgets to get us there. Luckily for humanity, we have all of the inspiration and dreams we can hope for thanks to science fiction. And so today we'll be taking a look at 10 extreme vehicles designed to take humans to very extreme places. In the Star Wars universe, they say the best starship builders are aquatic species. Individuals like the Mon Calamari and the Corns have been for many generations perfecting holes in underwater structures to withstand the massive pressures of the deep ocean. I mean, sure, in space, the problem is keeping the pressure from inside of your ship from leaking out instead of the massive crushing pressure of the ocean from coming inside of your little bubble. But in many ways, the ocean and its massive weight is far more dangerous than the vacuum of space. At the deepest part of our ocean here on Earth, in the Marianas Trench, seven miles below the surface, there is about 16,000 pounds of pressure per inch. Just compare that with the 14.7 uh, PSI found on the International Space Station or the 4 PSI found in an astronaut spacesuit. The deep ocean all of a sudden seems like a much scarier place. In the recent horror film Underwater, an energy company known as Tian Industries has created a series of research and drilling facilities deep underwater inside of the Marianas Trench. At the core of this facility was Kepler-822. This was a massive permanent structure that could sustain the lives of dozens if not hundreds of people. The crews could use a series of underwater train tunnels and elevators to go from one drill site to another while using extremely durable pressure suits. Now, the size and scope of this operation is a bit ridiculous. There are far cheaper and shallower areas in the ocean where fossil fuels can be extracted that are also not Cthulhu infested. But the technology does exist for humans to go as deep as the Marianas Trench. In 1960, Jacques Picard, or Jackie's Picard, descended to the bottom of the Marianas Trench in a deep diving research vessel. They managed to reach a depth of 10,960 meters. There have been several other successful attempts to reach the bottom of the Marianas Trench since then, including one attempt by that blue monkey-loving film director, James Cameron. When Earth is invaded by a terrifying alien race known as the Harvesters because they harvest resources from planets without any regard for the sentient species on them, Eternal President Whitmore makes the difficult decision to use one of America's tactical nuclear weapons to destroy one of the massive city destroyer alien saucer ships, currently residing over the city of Houston. With most of our air force effectively destroyed and grounded by the alien scum, we are forced to use other means to see if the nuclear attack actually is successful or not, aka a small tank that is shielded from blast and radiation and placed relatively close to the detonation's epicenter. Now, we're not exactly sure what kind of vehicle this is. It seems like some kind of eight-wheeled infantry fighting vehicle. I believe it's a LAV-25 anti-aircraft defense variant. You can see the Stinger missile launchers mounted onto the turret. Now, this movie was shot in 1996, and back then our military probably had a vehicle for this exact purpose. They most likely would have used a TBZ Fuchs, a small German armored personnel carrier, which was designed for these types of missions. But nowadays, we got this beast, the M1135 Nuclear Biological and Chemical Reconnaissance Vehicle, or NBCRV. God, that's a mouthful. This vehicle is built on the Stryker platform and it's designed to protect the soldiers inside of it from radiation, contaminants, and probably even COVID. In 2057, the sun begins to cool down, which leads to freezing temperatures here on Earth and a huge decrease in visible light. Humanity is left with very few options and gathers all of their resources together and builds two massive starships to deliver a nuclear weapon with a mass of the city of Manhattan into the sun. 
Because that's humanity's solution to everything. World War II, aliens, asteroids, Godzilla, just fire a nuke at it. But even with the sun slowly dying and cooling down, it was still a star and getting close enough to it without completely burning up was a huge problem. This is why the Icarus class spacecraft was designed with a massive heat shield, which is oriented to protect the rest of the structure of the ship. A lot of the early drama in this film comes from one of the panels not closing on the heat shield, which could potentially compromise the entire ship. Now, in real life, in 2018, NASA launched the Parker Solar Probe. This was a small vehicle designed to fly into the low solar corona. It will eventually get as close as 3.83 million miles to the surface of the sun in 2024, which will also be the closest humanity has ever gotten to the sun. That is, if that heat shield works properly. So we took a look at what would happen if the sun started cooling down. What would happen if the Earth's molten core stopped spinning? You know, the one that generates Earth's magnetic field and prevents our flat Earth disk from being bombarded by solar rays. Well, the solution here is pretty obvious. We'll just send nukes into the core of the Earth, but how does one get there? The deepest hole ever dug by humans was done by the Soviets in 1907 when they dug a hole that was 12,262 meters deep with just a nine inch diameter. That heroic effort was not even deep enough to penetrate the crust of the Earth. There are a lot of challenges associated with digging deep into the Earth. In many ways, it's probably even harder than reaching the surface of the Sun. And that's because the deeper you dig, the higher the temperature and pressure is. And once you reach the mantle layer, the temperature can reach 1000 Celsius, hot enough to make most metals on Earth liquid. Even though the Sun is extremely hot, you're still flying in space and surrounded by a vacuum, which does not effectively conduct heat. What does effectively conduct heat is lava and molten metal. Now in the film, The Core, humanity designs a crazy drilling machine named Virgil to tackle this almost impossible mission. This was a 180 foot long vessel with several different compartments on it. He used an ultrasonic laser to drill through materials and its armored hull was made out of unobtainium. This material is most likely mined from Pandora and would grow stronger as it absorbs more heat and pressure. Sounds like the perfect MacGuffin material, but that is exactly how humanity is able to nuke The Core back into rotation. Okay, so we have that scenario where the sun dies and we send a nuke into it. But what if the sun ages rapidly in 2061 and begins turning into a red giant and threatens to engulf the Earth within a hundred years? Facing their destruction, the United Earth government comes up with an interesting plan known as the Wandering Earth Project. The plan was to build a series of underground bunkers all across the planets and turn the Earth into essentially a flying spaceship. This way, the Earth could leave our solar system and then travel to the nearby Alpha Centauri system, which is also where Pandora is located. The UEG manages to do this by combining all of humanity's resources together and installing 12,000 massive fusion-powered Earth engines along the Northern Hemisphere and several torque engines around the equator. I mean, these things are impressive, like Warhammer 40K impressive. They need to stop the Earth's spin before they start their journey. This, of course, creates all sorts of insane damage to the surface of the planet and its tectonic plates. To make matters worse, when the Earth tries to use Jupiter for a gravity assist, Several engines fail, causing the Earth to go onto a collision course with the planets. Interesting concept. I think it's a little bit overkill, but hey, man, like I'm nostalgic about the Earth too. Why not bring it along with you? The planet of Pandora held all of the resources needed to save Earth from overpopulation and its other growing pains. The only problem is Pandora is 4.37 light years away. On a galactic scale, that is minuscule, but for a tiny little human being, that amount of distance is almost incomprehensible. But it is our destiny and right to conquer the stars and eradicate Xeno threats, and so humanity builds the ISV Venture Star, a massive one mile long ship designed to ferry hundreds of humans to Pandora in just around seven years. Which actually is relatively quick, and that's because the ISV can go up to 0.7 times the speed of light, which is just absolutely incredible and completely out of our reach at this point in time. For your reference, that's around 469 million miles per hour. Right now, the fastest thing ever launched by humans is that Parker Solar Probe we just talked about. It's supposed to be able to reach 450,000 miles per hour, just a tiny fraction of the ISV Venture Star's speed. The point is, traveling even to the closest star system is going to take a lot of time. While seven years might seem like a long time on the Venture Star, 
With our current technology, it might take multiple generations. And so one way to mitigate the aging issue and resource consumption issue is by having colonists and crew on board go into cryo sleep. This is where a human's metabolism and cellular movements are slowed down immensely or even frozen. We're still pretty far from being able to like freeze people solid in carbonite or just anything because, you know, humans are made out of a lot of water and when water freezes, it expands and it turns into ice crystals and that would not be pretty inside of your body. But there is, however, some interesting research being done in how we can slow down a human's metabolism by lowering their temperature or even placing them in a chemically induced coma. But of course, there are still severe risks associated with that. So apparently in 2014, in an alternate reality, scientists decide to spray the stratosphere with some type of aerosol that's designed to reflect sunlight away from Earth. Unfortunately, in this alternative reality, they probably didn't have the matrix to warn them about how stupid of an idea this was. And soon after, as expected, a new ice age emerges, freezing over the majority of humanity. Thankfully, a strange and reclusive transportation magnet has built a self-sustaining nuclear power train that circumnavigates the entire Earth. It has a giant plow on the front of it, and it just continuously blasts through snow and ice as it journeys in a circle around the world. The train runs for almost 18 years until class struggle kind of derails it all. This is due to the inequalities on the train, which had developed its own society with a heavily structured class system based on the fare you bought when you first entered the train. You have first class, second class, coach, and then the people who stowed away. Carl Sagan was one of those rare individuals who not only partook in the sciences, but also tried to shape public views on the future in a hopeful and optimistic way. When he wrote the novel Contact, it was very original and different from your usual sci-fi affair. No humans trying to solve problems with nuclear weapons. The story instead centers around Jodie Foster, who starts out the movie working at the SETI program in the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. This was a nonprofit organization dedicated to the search for extraterrestrial life in the galaxy. Unfortunately for Jodie Foster, Sean Bean and Pierce Brosnan decide to have a scuffle on the telescope and end up destroying it, forcing NASA to decommission this amazing site. Jodie Foster is forced to move her operation to the very large array in New Mexico. It's here she receives one of the first recorded messages from outer space directed to humanity. The message turns out to be a lengthy code. Hidden inside of it are schematics for a giant machine, which purposes are unknown. Humanity is highly divided on whether they should build this machine. It could be a weapon. After all, these are aliens giving us blueprints for some unknown machine. But Jodie Foster believes that this is a machine that will take her to go see the aliens. They have contacted her. The machine itself is made up of three rapidly spinning gimbaled rings and a capsule which drops right through the rings. The pilot sits in this capsule. When Jodie Foster enters the machine and launches it, she ends up flying through a wormhole and goes on this like trippy 18 hour journey in which she meets an alien life form. Unfortunately for everyone else witnessing this moment from the outside, all they see is her drop through the machine straight into a safety net. But the proof of her journey could be found on a recording device, which unfortunately only recorded static, but it recorded it for 18 hours. Do you guys remember in 2012 when everyone thought the world was gonna end because of the Mayans? You know, like the same Mayans who clearly were not that good at surviving? Well, Roland Emmerich of Independence Day and Day After Tomorrow fame and is currently making a movie about the moon flying into the Earth thought it'd be a good idea to make a movie about 2012 and 2009 to further scare people even more. I don't really remember what exactly happened in the movie, to be honest, but something causes a massive flood to wash over the entire planet in a very biblical way. And also, in a very biblical way, several nations come together and build nine massive arcs in the Himalayas. Each one is capable of carrying up to 100,000 people and able to withstand the pounding of huge tsunami waves. So there you have it guys, 10 amazing vehicles that are designed to protect fragile humans while they venture to some of the most extreme and dangerous places in the galaxy. Let me know in the comment section below if I've missed any other extreme vehicle for extreme places. And also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.